Welcome to what Star Wars Attack of the Clones should have been. This is a continuation of the story that was started back in my What Phantom Menace Should Have Been video, as this is supposed to be a complete alternate history of the prequels. Now it's not a requirement that you have seen my rewrite of The Phantom Menace, because I'll fill you in as we go, but obviously it will add more to the experience if you have seen it, as there's a number of elements from that story that carry over and influence things in this movie. And as I mentioned in the previous video, these fanfiction prequels are intended to primarily fit into the original movie trilogy. Although I have borrowed a few things from the expanded universe here and there, I'm mostly just focusing on the original movies. So forgive me if I accidentally step on some of the expanded universe lore, but apparently almost none of that exists anymore thanks to Disney, so I guess it doesn't matter. So then, with all of that out of the way, I give you Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. The invasion of Alderaan set off a blaze that now threatens to engulf the entire galaxy in total war. A conflict unlike any the Republic has faced before. The Clone Wars. Many systems have surrendered to the clones rather than risk conflict, while others have willingly allied with this new power as a means to rid themselves of Republic law. These systems in league with the clone armies, under the leadership of Darth Maul, call themselves the Separatists. Desperate to beat back the seemingly endless horde of clones, the Republic has authorized the creation of a galactic army to defend what remains of Republic space. Led by the Jedi Order, the first major battle of this army is now underway. A planetary-wide battle to seize back control of the vital world of Naboo, a world with the second-largest reserves of Janty in the galaxy, a naturally occurring nutrient that is vital for the creation of clones. If the Separatists seize control of these resources, the clone armies could multiply to numbers so vast that they would overrun Republic territory like a plague. This is a battle that the Republic cannot afford to lose. On the bridge of the command ship, we find Mace Windu leading the attack. The last of the destroyers is out of hyperspace. Scan the planet. The Separatist fleet is rallying to block us. Good. Fire on these coordinates, and keep your eyes peeled for an opening. They're pulling ships from the west as reinforcements. Then that's where we'll send the first wave. Send the coordinates for them to come out of hyperspace. Send the nearest TIE fighter squads to clear a path to the planet's surface. The first wave is almost at the surface. Signal the second wave and move these destroyers in to form a perimeter. Keep the highway open, we'll funnel our dropships through it.
Inside a galactic walker, we see Obi-Wan Kenobi. He makes a hologram call. Anakin, we're moving on the clone defences on the northern side of the city. Master Fisto is approaching from the south. What's your situation? Anakin is cruising low in another dropship with his squad of troopers with him. Scanners are detecting something in the jungle to the west. That could be our Gentane mine. We'll have to approach on land to be sure. I'll send some TIE fighters to circle the jungle in case you need them. Be careful, my old Padawan. You too, my friend. The dropship hovers low when Anakin and his squad jump out and make their way into the jungle. Back with Obi-Wan, they are hammering clone defences at the city's edges. Master Fistu, we've broken through on the north side. We should be coming through the south in a moment. Then we'll meet you in the middle. A hooded figure slips through the crowds that populate the busy nightlife streets of Coruscant and ducks into the shadows of a narrow alley. Discreetly leaning against a wall, the figure makes a mark before moving back out into the streets and merging with the crowd again. As the figure passes a small garden area, in a barely discernible motion, drops a small package into the garden and continues on. The figure makes a big circle all the way around the block to return to the original spot and sees that the mark left now has an additional mark added, forming an X. On seeing this, the figure turns around, enters a different alley, and moves to a drain pipe, reaching behind it, retrieving a different package attached by a magnet to the back of the pipe, and stashes it inside his cloak, before disappearing back into the shadows. This is what the spy world would call a dead drop with signal drops. When information needs to be exchanged, a pre-arranged spot is selected where it will be dropped, in this case, the garden. The one making the drop leaves the signal to the handler that they're about to make the drop, which is the mark on the wall, for the handler to see. The handler can then collect the package within only a minute or so of it having been left, and leaves another signal, the second mark, to the spy telling them that he's got the package and that it's safe for the spy to go to the second drop, in this case the drain pipe, to collect their pay as well as information on where the next dead drop will be. In this way, a spy and a handler can pass information back and forth for years without ever actually meeting face to face. The spy might never even meet the handler at all. I don't know if anyone else finds that interesting at all, but I just find that kind of stuff fascinating. And it's going to come into play later, so keep it in the back of your brain. The figure makes its way back to a speeder, jumps in and pulls back the hood, revealing Padme. Back at the Battle of Naboo, Obi-Wan's forces are sieging the biggest Separatist stronghold in the city. Meanwhile, in the jungle, Anakin's squad has located the source of the signal they were detecting. Looks like the structure is underwater. Would be a good place to hide a Gentane mine. Anakin tells all of his men to remove their helmets to put on their breathing gear so that they can swim down there. And we see that these troopers are not clones like their Separatist opponents. They are just regular dudes that have joined the Galactic Army to take up the fight against the clones. I'm with Red Letter Media on this one. If there are to be clones, which... There has to be, because Luke did mention it in A New Hope. You fought in the Clone Wars? Then the clones should be fighting for the Separatists, and the Republic troops should be regular guys. That way you actually care if a trooper dies, because he probably has a family that he's leaving behind. And as we will see, that's going to be a necessary part as to why Anakin does what he does in this story, and eventually becomes Darth Vader. One of Anakin's soldiers was from Naboo before the clones attacked. The Gungans used to have a secret underwater city. No one ever knew where it was, but after the clones attacked, all the Gungans hid there. If this is that underwater city, they're probably all still down there now. But if the clones have already found it and taken it over, then this could be the Gentane mine that we're looking for. I guess we won't know until we get down there. But either way, I wouldn't expect a warm welcome. They put on their breathing gear and dive beneath the surface and swim down into the blackness below. Slowly lights appear in the watery depths and an orb containing the glowing city comes into view. They swim to an entrance and morph through the liquid substance that holds back the water of the swamp. Anakin and his troopers remove their breathing gear and look around. This is it. It's the Gungan city. Where is everybody? All the lights are on so somebody has to be here. Anakin suddenly snaps to attention. 
ambush! He brings his hands together in a clapping motion, and in an instant, hundreds of objects from all around are levitated in front of them. They slam together, forming a wall of metal, rock, and steel. In the same instance, clones pop up from all over the place and unleash a volley of laser blasts. Everyone ducks behind the hovering wall that Anakin has pulled together. It starts to break apart from the heavy fire it's taken. Break cover on my mark, stand in 2 by 2 formation. Ready? Go! He force pushes the wall and it shatters apart, with pieces flying right back at all of the clones. They are showered in debris and have to duck out of the way. All the troopers charge them in twos, blasting away as they go. Anakin runs forward towards a group of clones. He ignites both of his lightsabers and dual wielding his weapons, he launches himself right into the middle of a big pile of clones and like a spinning whirlwind of death, goes to work, sending arms and legs and heads flying left, right and centre. He is untouchable, he is so fast, so deadly, so lethal, they never even get a single shot off. Anakin retracts his lightsabers just in time for the last of the clones to hit the floor. We can see that Anakin has become battle-hardened by the war. Cutting down enemy has become just another day at the office for him. Outside, Anakin's troopers are finishing off the last of the clones. One of them that's climbed up on the rooftop to scout ahead says that he can see the mining site at the center of town along with all the Gungans. They hurry down the street into the town square where they indeed find the mining site as well as... No! They're dead! They're all dead! Ah! Every single Gungan in the entire universe was there. Now they're extinct. No more. Who knows, you know, maybe one of those guys could have been a character that we might have known in Star Wars, but not gonna happen, because they are all dead. The troopers look on in horror at this huge pile of Gungan heads. As one of them steps closer, his foot presses down on a hidden plate in the ground. RUN! A huge mound of explosives that was hidden under the Gungan heads detonates, incinerating everything around him. As Anakin dives into the air, he's able to throw up a force shield around him, enough to protect himself from the blast. As he hits the ground, a thick cloud of dust and debris cloak the entire area. On the surface, Obi-Wan walks into the now captured Separatist stronghold. He has to step over many dead clones to do this. As he does, he looks down at them and says, By the Force, I really wish they would just surrender. They were bred for combat, Master Kenobi. Surrender's not a concept they're familiar with. It's right this way. The trooper leads Obi-Wan into a control room and nods to some of the techno guys there that are hacking into the Separatist computers. And they bring up... An eerie silence falls over the room. Who else has seen these files? Just us. Make sure it stays that way until I tell you otherwise. Understood. At Coruscant, news of the Galactic Army succeeding in retaking Naboo has gotten people dancing in the street. This is the first real victory that the Republic has had against the Separatists since the war began. And Chancellor Palpatine is throwing a party in celebration with all the senators and politicians. One of which is Prince Valium. Since the invasion of Alderaan in the first movie, Prince Valium has overseen the welfare of his people as refugees. Most of his people have settled in temporary housing here on Coruscant, and the plight of the Alderanians in not being able to return home has become somewhat of a rallying cry as to why the Separatists need to be defeated, so that the people of Alderaan can return home. The prince's father took being driven from their homeworld very hard, and he eventually died a broken man, now leaving Valium to take on the mantle of king. However, Valium has repeatedly refused to accept the title of king because he doesn't feel like he can accept it until he is able to return his people to their homeworld. In his mind, only then will he have earned the crown. And since not everyone did succeed in fleeing Alderaan in the first movie, there are still little pockets of people scattered around the planet. 
So Valium has been working to coordinate these groups into like a mini resistance and a spy network that can send him information from behind enemy lines. In fact, it was through these Alderaan spies that the Republic figured out the importance of Gentane in the cloning process. So through this, the Prince is kind of getting experience of what it's like to sort of run a rebellion. Skills that could be very useful that he could one day pass on to a certain somebody. Also in the room is Count Dooku, who is actually quite different in this version. He's not an ex-Jedi. In fact, he's not a Force user at all. What he is, is Chancellor Palpatine's political ally. Kind of like this dude in the prequel movies. You know, that dude, he was like in on Palpatine's plan. He wasn't a Sith, but he was a political ally and he was always there. And I guess that makes sense, because Palpatine would need political allies on his side to help him enact all these schemes. So in this version, Count Dooku is his chief ally in politics. In fact, Dooku is basically like the vice president. He's Palpatine's second in command. And through him, Palpatine does a lot of his shady deals. So Palpatine also keeps him around kind of like to be a fall guy. In case the Jedi ever start to catch on to him, he can be like, Nope, it was Dooku. Wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. Palpatine taps his wine glass with a spoon and silences the lively room and raises his glass for a toast. My dear friends, today is a historic day for the Republic, for it is a day that not only we will remember, but our enemies will too. It's a victory made possible by regular citizens of the Republic, regular people who joined the Galactic Army and decided to fight to protect the Republic, not just leaving it up to the Jedi, but decided to take their own fate into their own hands. because they have a passion for what this glorious Republic stands for. And through that passion, they've gained strength. And through that strength, they've gained power. And through that power, they've gained a victory for us all. A victory that set us free from the chains of tyranny and oppression. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to propose a toast. Through victory, may our chains be broken. Through victory, may our chains be broken! In the Republic starships that are heading back from Naboo, Anakin is sitting with his head bowed when Obi-Wan enters the room. How are you feeling? Tired. Me too. But we did it. We took back Naboo. What were our casualties? Obi-Wan pauses. 20,000 dead on the surface, another 5,000 in orbit. Plus all of the Gungans. Yes, I heard. I'm sorry. This has to stop. Remember what Master Yoda said, the dark side feeds on war, and war feeds on all of us. And he's right. The most challenging state for a Jedi to be in is one of prolonged conflict. That's why I agree with the Chancellor. We should negotiate a truce with the Separatists. They keep their territory, we keep ours, but at least this fighting stops. If they honored their side of the agreement, which I doubt they would, and even if they do, we're not just fighting the Separatists, we're fighting the dark side. They're led by a Sith, you remember? If we made a truth, that would create a pocket in the galaxy where the dark side can grow unchallenged and eventually come back maybe even stronger. Now we have to press on until the entire galaxy is wiped clean. And in the meantime, every living thing in the galaxy has to pay the price. Anakin, the dark side is like a raging fire. It's not enough to mostly extinguish it. Even if there's just a few sparks left, it can ignite again. We have to sacrifice today if we want to have a tomorrow. Obi-Wan looks at Anakin intently. How many of your men died? Anakin looks down at the floor. All of them. What? Yeah, like you said. I just hope it's worth it. The ship lands on Coruscant and Obi-Wan and Anakin step out. Obi-Wan is quickly approached by a few military types. He turns to Anakin. Give my regards to your friends. I will. They hustle Obi-Wan away into a secure room so he can make his report to the War Council which includes the Jedi Council, a few military generals, Prince Valium, Chancellor Palpatine, and Count Dooku. On the other side of the galaxy, Talon is training her saber fighting against a bunch of battle droids. Into the room walks Darth Maul. Very good. You've improved greatly. I just think of them as being that Jedi from Alderaan. Don't worry, your time will come. The dark side will deliver him to you, and then you will have your revenge. In the last movie, her and Obi-Wan had a fight, and she copped a serious thrashing. You heard about Naboo? Of course. By now the plans would have reached Coruscant. Do you think he believes it? That we're getting ready to build the Death Star without him? 
He'll want confirmation before he moves on it, but we should ready ourselves for our final battle with him. Do you think we can do it? Kill Sidious? Maybe, with great difficulty. But now that he's seen the plans, we're going to have to make a move before he does. I'm much better with the saber now, but against him? He doesn't even use a saber. I know, but we always knew it was going to come down to him or us. We have to ready ourselves nonetheless. As the sun sets over the city skyline of Coruscant, Anakin is meditating, trying to cleanse his mind of the mental images of battle. When he senses someone approaching, he opens his eyes and turns around. Chancellor Palpatine, welcome home, my young friend. I'm greatly relieved to see you've returned safely. How are you feeling? Um... Anakin goes silent as a few Jedis walk past. I have transportation waiting if you would like a ride somewhere. Yes, thank you. They walk and they talk, just light chit chat about this and that, until they reach Palpatine's space limousine, waiting outside the Jedi Temple with a whole bunch of his bodyguards. After all, he is the Chancellor and there is a war on, so he's going to need a ton of security around him wherever he goes. He and Anakin jump in and fly off, followed by all the security. Now in private, Palpatine hands a small pouch to Anakin, who opens it to reveal a large collection of vials with a light blue liquid in them. Anakin's hand trembles ever so slightly as he opens one of the vials and drinks it. A few seconds later, his hand steadies. We have to keep you healthy, my young friend. Do you remember back in the last movie how Anakin had a ton of force energy transferred through him that completely fried out his nervous system? And you remember that the doc said that he would either recover completely and be okay, or he would eventually have to be put into an iron lung to regulate all his bodily functions for him. Well, Anakin is not okay. The damage done to him is beyond repair, and his body is gradually shutting down. But since Palpatine is such a wonderful guy, he has scientists working on a new experimental type of suit that can work as an iron lung, but will still allow Anakin to function. But since this is such a specialized type of equipment, it takes a fair amount of time to build it, and it's not quite ready yet. So in the meantime, Anakin is taking this medication just to help him get by. The medication doesn't fix his problem, it basically just suppresses the symptoms. And as his condition is deteriorating, he's needing to take more and more medication to keep going. And this presents a problem. Jedis are not allowed to use any kind of medication because the Council doesn't want Jedis to develop a dependency on drugs, for obvious reasons. So if a Jedi is not able to heal themselves just through their meditation and such, then they have to stop being a Jedi until they've fully healed up and off the medication. But the thing is, Anakin doesn't want to stop being a Jedi and stop fighting the war, because remember, he is called the savior of Alderaan. He is a war hero. People recognize him in the streets and thank him for saving their lives on Alderaan. And most importantly, he knows how badly Padme wants to return back to her home world. How badly she wants to see it free of the Separatist, but he can't help with that if he has to give up being a Jedi. So Palpatine has figured out a solution. He will get him the medication that he needs secretly so that he can keep functioning, keep fighting the war, and keep being a Jedi until his suit is ready. And no one will ever know. As far as everybody else is concerned, Anakin is keeping himself together with good old-fashioned Jedi meditation. So the drugs are allowing him to keep being a Jedi until his suit is ready. And in this, we also see the beginning of like a dependency between Anakin and Palpatine. Anakin thanks Palpatine for the medication and puts it in his bag. Palpatine turns to him slowly. You know, Anakin, I heard that you agree with my suggestion to draw up a peace treaty with the Separatists. Yes, I do. But I suppose the Council has good reasons for why they disagreed with your proposal. Disagreed? Oh yes, that was what we called it publicly, but a more accurate description would be they blocked the proposal. Blocked? Hmm, yes. Even though the majority of senators were willing to support a peace treaty, they never got the chance to because it was blocked by the Jedi Council before it could be voted on. They can do that? Oh yes. Since the Council is intended to be a safeguard against corruption, one of the powers afforded to them is the power to block legislation. You remember they did the same thing when I tried to form a galactic army way before the war began. I remember. Thankfully though, they eventually came around and now we have our army. But waiting for them to come around certainly came at a price. Yes, it has. I fear that if we wait for them to come around this time, it might come to cost us more than we can afford. He presses a button and a mini hologram projector folds out. Anakin leans forward, looking at it. Master Kenobi found these on Naboo. It's a weapon capable of destroying an entire planet. And the Separatists are getting ready to build it. If they succeed, it's all over. 
we need to end the war now. Not later, but now. Anakin sits back, stunned. You understand that what I'm about to tell you must be kept in the utmost confidence. Of course. What if I told you there are those among the Separatists who also desire peace with the Republic? Many of the systems that allied themselves with the clones are being saddled with having to provide equipment for the war. It's put quite a strain on them, and they're becoming more than a little tired of it. We've been in contact with a high-ranking Separatist leader who is willing to make a deal with us. Who is he? Which leader? His name is Tarkin. Moff Tarkin? He's one of Darth Maul's inner circle. Why would he be willing to make a deal with us? Palpatine points at the hologram. Because of this. Tarkin's not a stupid man. He knows that if Darth Maul builds a weapon like this, it could just as easily be used on his own planet as it could be on one of ours. He'd like to avoid that. You see, we didn't find these plans on Naboo by chance. He left them there for us. Anakin starts to smile. You see where this is going, yes? He's going to help us capture Darth Maul. That's right, my young friend. With Maul out of the picture, he will rise to the position of Grand Moff Tarkin and take on the leadership. From then, he can come to us with an offer of peace. And the war ends. And the war ends. In fact, we've already agreed on many of the details of the peace treaty. The first one being the return of Alderaan. Anakin looks at him, startled. It's logical that we select a planet to be neutral so that the two sides can meet together in peace to negotiate. And what better planet than Alderaan? Now for the plan to work, we need Jedis that have been in the presence of both Darth Maul and his sister Talon previously, who would be able to sense their presence again. Obi-Wan and myself. That's right, on Alderaan you both came into close contact with them. Obi-Wan more so than me, but yes. So if the two of you succeed, we end the war. That is, assuming that you accept the mission. I absolutely accept. The limo slows to a stop in the street. You sure you want to be dropped here? Yes, I'm meeting some friends. Well, don't stay up too late. You leave first thing in the morning. Thank you, Chancellor. No, my young friend. Thank you. Anakin steps out of the car, and as Palpatine's envoy departs, he walks into a cantina. And there waiting for him is Owen, Baru, and of course, Padme. He greets them all, and Padme slides a drink over to him. Thank you. It's on me. He takes a drink and looks around. There's a lot of people out tonight. Everyone celebrating the liberation of Naboo. A droid waiter comes over and delivers a whole new round of drinks to them all. We didn't order that. Compliments of the patrons over there for your service to the Republic as a Jedi. A group across the room raise their glasses to Anakin. He gestures a thank you back to them. We should come out drinking with you more often. Maybe I should change clothes next time before I head out. It wouldn't matter. Everyone already knows your face. Yeah, you're the savior of Alderaan. Anakin takes another drink. Yeah, the Force willing, you guys will be home again, hopefully soon. Padme raises her glass. The Force willing. Even if we do get to go back, it won't ever be the same again. Sometimes I just wish we had not gotten involved. Well, we didn't really have a choice about being involved. The clones came down whether we liked it or not. Anakin finishes his glass. I have to go. They're shipping me out again tomorrow morning. So soon? You only just got back. It must be pretty important. How long do you think you'll be away for? Anakin looks at him with a slight raised eyebrow. He can't say, you know that. Sorry. Padme takes out a small device. You got time for a few moves before you go? Anakin chuckles. Sure. The two of them go over to a booth and sit down. She puts the device in the center of the table between them and switches it on. Up comes a hologram of space chess, like the one that we saw in A New Hope. This is a little custom that Anakin and Padme have. They've been playing this same game of space chess for quite a while now. Anakin makes his move. They subtly smile at each other across the table. Back at Maul's base, he is working away on some consoles when Moth Tarkin enters the room. Maul doesn't turn to face him. What is it, Tarkin? My workers at a Gentane mine came across something I thought you'd be interested in, which is Mandalorian iron. Maul turns. You're certain. Well, the machines can't cut through it. They ended up having to cut around it just to get it out of the rock. I presume that you would wish to inspect it yourself to make sure. Is it your workers or clones at the mine? My workers. Tell them to leave immediately. No one is to enter that mine again until I arrive. Very good. I have a squadron of soldiers nearby that can provide security for you. When would you like to leave? Maul walks past him and out the door. Right now. Tarkin grins to himself. Yes, my lord. 
Mandalorian iron is a very special and rare form of iron in the Star Wars universe. Reason being, it can be forged to form armor, which can actually block a lightsaber blade, laser blasts, and can even absorb force lightning, which we all know is something Palpatine is a really big fan of using. The next day, the ship carrying Anakin and Obi-Wan is leaving Coruscant. Anakin and Obi-Wan are sitting beside each other on consoles. Anakin is looking over some of the recorded chess moves between him and Padme. Obi-Wan glances over at his screen. Is that a different game between you two? No, no, it's still the same one. That has to be the longest game in history. I don't understand it. I can plan actual battles and win, but when it comes to playing her, I just can't beat her. She is very good. I hear she was one of the best back on Alderaan. No one was willing to play her anymore. She wipes them out in a matter of minutes. Well, I've survived this long, so I must be doing something right. You're pretty good. Maybe you could give me some pointers. Obi-Wan leans over and has a look at the screen. I thought I had her cornered a few times, but she always manages to get away. You thought you had her cornered. That's just it. It's all a game of deception. Obi-Wan goes quiet for a while as he ponders over the moves on the screen. The Chancellor didn't tell me that Master Windu was coming on the mission as well. He made it sound like it was going to be just the two of us. It was supposed to be, but the Council decided to send him with us. I guess it makes sense. Maul will have his sister with him, so if there's two of them, it's better that there's three of us. It would be better if there was four or five of us, but this is a war that has many fronts, and we don't even know if Maul will be there. He will be there. I know it. A trooper approaches them. We've gone into hyperspace. Master Window will be briefing the men in five minutes. We'll be there. The trooper leaves and Obi-Wan gets up to walk out. Shall we? Wait a second, the game. Oh, right, the game. Well, you don't need to worry about losing. What do you mean? Well, from what I could see, she's had plenty of opportunities to beat you, but she never seems to take them. What? Well, why not? I told you, it's all a game of deceptions, my old Padawan. Looking like you're after one thing, but you're really after something else. One thing's pretty clear from what I can see. It's not the game that she's interested in. Anakin has a kind of surprised look on his face. Obi-Wan slaps him on the back roughly. Ah, come on! We got a water fight, you know. Obi-Wan pauses before leaving the room. You see? You may have graduated from being my apprentice, but that doesn't mean I can't still teach you things. He leaves the room and Anakin's surprised look slowly changes to a goofy looking grin. Back on Coruscant, it's the middle of the night. Padme is fast asleep when something awakens her. She reaches over and turns on a light. Oh, oh, are you trying to give me a heart attack? What are you doing in here? Talk. We must. At the Gentane mine, a shuttle lands in the hangar and a few workers are waiting. Maul and Talon get out, followed by Tarkin. The mine is empty as per your orders, everyone except these workers who found the iron. They'll be able to take you to where it is. Maul turns to Tarkin. You wait here. Yes, my lord. The workers lead Maul and Talon through some of the tunnels until they reach a chunk of silver iron sitting at the end of a tunnel. This is it. Maul approaches, ignites his saber and swings at the chunk of iron. And sure enough, it does not cut through. Maul turns to Talon. It's real. Worrying this is armor could give us the edge we need to defeat Sidious. And with him dead and the construction of the Death Star, this galaxy will be ours. He turns to the workers. Do any other workers know about this iron? No, we found it and then we closed off the tunnel straight away. No one else knows about it except Moff Tarkin. <laughs> We can't risk Sidious finding out that we have the iron before we confront him. He retracts his blade and Talon levitates the chunk of iron with them as they head back out of the tunnel. Outside, the Jedi and the troopers are approaching the mine, when suddenly, they hear a sound. What was that? It sounded like a shuttle. Maybe Maul did bring security with him after all, or that could have been Maul leaving already. If that was him leaving, we should get our shuttle and chase him down. But if it wasn't him leaving and he's still inside, we'll miss him if we go after it. Windu turns to Obi-Wan. We need to know if Maul is still in the mine. I can't try to sense him now. We're not even inside. We'll have a huge head start on us. We don't have a choice. Do it. Obi-Wan closes his eyes and he stretches out with a force. Inside, Maul and Talon are almost back at the hangar when they both suddenly stop in their tracks. Did you feel that? Yes. You were right. The dark side has finally delivered him to me. She drops the iron and grabs her lightsaber. Stop! Forget him, we have to take the iron. That Jedi is my kill, and Sidious is mine. 
We need the Iron to defeat him. Once he's dead, we can scan the entire galaxy to find this Jedi of yours. But we are not going to jeopardize our best chance to seize control of the galaxy just so you can kill one Jedi. Talon reluctantly clips her saber back on her belt again. Very well, but I want that Jedi. I have a vengeance to collect. And you will, but we must take the Iron now. She levitates it again and they run down the passageway and into the hangar. Maul slides to a stop and fury flashes in his eyes. No! Where's the shuttle? Maul roars in frustration. Tarkin! He must have told the Jedi they could find us here. He set this whole thing up. Turns out you will get your revenge after all. Obi-Wan enters the mine, followed by Windu and Anakin, with the troopers coming in behind them. Maul and Talon race into a small control room and they see the Jedi and the stormtroopers on one of the security monitors. Maul points at a different monitor. There, we'll fight them in there. There's a generator by the walkway ahead of them. I think we can overload it from here. Obi-Wan leads the others along. Can you still sense them? Yes, they're still here. We best be ready. They round a corner and see the generator by the walkway spewing out electricity. We can't get through that. We'll have to find another way around. We don't have time to go around. Maul and Talon could be gone any second. We could use force shields and jump through, and then we could project shields for the troopers and bring all them through one by one. Still, that would take too long. Windu turns to the troopers. We'll take it from here. You join the others back at the shuttle and wait for our call. The troopers leave and make their way back to the shuttle. Windu readies himself, concentrates, and puts up a projective wall of force energy around him. He then takes a running leap and dives through the electricity and clears the other side. All right, come on through. Anakin and Obi-Wan look at each other and they have a quick game of rock, paper, scissors to see who goes next. Anakin loses, so it's his turn. He projects a shield and dives through and joins Windu on the other side. Obi-Wan readies himself. Wait, there's something. Obi-Wan! Silently, one of Anakin's sabers detaches from his belt and levitates up to just behind his head. Windu sees this and uses the force to quickly whip Anakin's head to the side, just as the saber ignites, missing him by inches. Windu fires up his saber and slashes Anakin's out of the air right above him, before spinning around to see Maul at the end of the walkway and outstretched. Obi-Wan is clashing with Talon and Force pushes her down some stairs. He yells back to the others, I'm alright, you two go get him. Maul disappears around the corner and Windu helps Anakin up. You alright? Thanks to you. You have another saber? Yes. Good. You'll need it. They run after Maul while Obi-Wan and Talon face off again. You should have killed me when you had the chance. I never wanted to kill you, and I still don't. Don't worry. You won't. Back in Coruscant, we see Padme making her dead drop just like before. She leaves the signal, makes the drop, circles the block, and when she comes back, her signal has not been crossed. She looks confused and waits for a while. As the seconds slowly turn to minutes, she decides to circle the block again. On the way, she checks the spot where she left the drop and sees that it has been picked up. She returns to her spot, but there is still no cross mark. She spins on her heel and hustles to the pipe where a pickup usually is. There's nothing there. I've been burned. Turn around, slowly. Padme turns. So, you're my handler. You were supposed to leave if you didn't see my signal. I can't do that. He holds up the package that she left. You think this is a joke? You're only as useful as the information that you give us. And this isn't information. The information's in my head. Then you better tell me. No, didn't you read what I wrote in that package? The Jedi are onto me. They know that I've been passing intel to the Separatists. It's only a matter of time before they arrest me. So you have to get me out of here. Do I? I've got a better idea. He aims his blaster at her. Wait, I'm not the only spy of yours that they're out to arrest soon. I know who else. I can tell you which of your contacts is in danger and which isn't. But if you shoot me, by this time tomorrow some of your most important contacts on this planet will be behind bars. You want to know who? Then get me safely into Separatist territory and I'll tell you. Or you can just shoot me and wait to see whether I'm telling the truth or not. I get you into Separatist space. And if it turns out that you're just making this up to get a free ticket off this planet, you'll end up wishing that you died here in this alley. Is that clear? Yes. Then follow me. Back at the mine, Talon is flying at Obi-Wan with everything she's got. She is like a space ninja, flipping around, striking from multiple angles, 
Obi-Wan can see that her skills are much higher than they were before. So he's evading and trying to bide his time, waiting for her to make a mistake so he can get the upper hand. Fight me, you coward! It's not me that you want to kill, it's your own innocence. She lunges towards him and he force jumps up onto a higher platform. You're not on this dark path by choice, and you only stay on it out of loyalty to your brother. But Sith don't have loyalty. Talon uses the force and rips the walkway out from under Obi-Wan. He crashes to the floor and manages to only half get up before he is charged by a screaming Talon. She pounds into him as Obi-Wan is struggling to block her strikes. A solid kick to the guts knocks enough strength out of him for her to swipe away his lightsaber. A blast of force from him staggers Talon enough for him to lunge and grab her by the wrist. They wrestle back and forth over the lightsaber. She sweeps one of his feet out from under him, tripping him, dropping him to the ground and she lands on top of him and leverages her body weight to slowly push the lightsaber blade towards his face. And just as it is about to burn through his face, he flicks his finger out across the handle and... Obi-Wan levitates his saber back to him. First rule of saber fighting, don't let the other guy turn off your lightsaber. Meanwhile, Mace Windu and Anakin track Maul into a room where he is waiting for them. You can't take both of us, Maul. So shall we do this the easy way? Maul unhooks his double-edged lightsaber. I guess not. Maul reaches out to the side and force rips a fuse out of a console in the wall. All the lights in the room go out, plunging all three of them into near pitch black darkness. Anakin, go back to back. We don't want him sneaking up on us. Slowly and silently, Anakin and Windu work their way through the room, snaking between pillars, using the glow from their sabers to light their way in the darkness in search of Darth Maul. Anakin's every fiber of himself is alert. His eyes are as wide as they can be. His ears tingling for even the slightest sound that will give a clue as to from which shadow Maul will spring from. Anakin, he's a Zabrak. Zabraks have excellent night vision. Use the force, try to sense where he is. The light from Anakin's saber picks up the outline of the fuse on the floor. Anakin grabs it with the force. Master Windu, I have the fuse. I can get the lights back on if we can get to the panel. I think it's over there. No, don't move. <laughs> Master, I'm all right. Windu steps forward and shines his lightsaber near Maul's body, seeing his face twisted into one last death pang. Anakin looks down at Darth Maul's body. That's for Alderaan and all the innocent lives that you've taken. Anakin, go put the lights back on. Anakin runs over, finds the control panel and sticks the fuse in and the room lights up again. No! Maul presses a button on a small device on his belt. I always knew that droid would prove useful someday. <laughs> you guys thought I just phantom menaced Darth Maul again, didn't you? No, I'm afraid not. Now, if you've played the Star Wars Force Unleashed video game, then you will have seen this particular droid before. It's Proxy. And Proxy can project a hologram over himself to make himself look like anybody. Ah, Master! Another excellent duel! Now, if you watch the Phantom Menace video that I made, you'll see in that, as well as everything in this movie up to this point, that there is not one single shot of Darth Maul that doesn't have proxy somewhere in the background. He is always there. Well, except when he's on a hologram call or whatever. But apart from that, he is always there. And that's because Maul has always kept Proxy by his side for just this reason, in case he needs to use him as a decoy. The only time that we have ever seen Maul without Proxy in the background is at the beginning of this fight. And that's because that's not Maul. That's Proxy pretending to be Maul. When I uploaded my Phantom Menace video, I was kind of worried that people might straight away recognize Proxy and pick that something like this was going to happen. But thankfully, nobody did. It's good because there's other little things like that hidden in the stories that are going to unfold in future events. 
Anakin is horrified that this legendary Jedi has been killed in such a way. Oh yes, death swallows us all without prejudice. From the greatest Jedi to the most worthless womp rat, there's no difference in death. Anakin is fixated on Windu's body when something happens. Maul notices too. Mace Windu's body slowly fades away until it vanishes, leaving behind just a clump of empty clothes. As Anakin witnesses this, he straightens up. Are you sure about that? Maul looks up from the empty clothes, puzzled. Then his mouth twists into a growl. Anakin pulls Windu's saber towards him and ignites both. They propel themselves forward with a force and collide with such an impact that it shakes the room around them. Maul unleashes a barrage of strikes that Anakin fends off before rolling out of the way of a strike. He turns and hits Maul with a blast of force. Maul throws up a shield to protect himself. As the blast hits the wall behind him, it smashes a few cracks in the stone. Anakin slams his sabers down into Maul's. They push into each other and Maul flips him around and tries to drive him backwards into the wall. But Anakin slams a knee into Maul's guts and with another blast of force, shoves him down. Maul's legs give out under the impact and he drops to a knee. Looking past Anakin to the cracked wall behind him, Maul rips a chunk of rock out and slams it into Anakin's back. Maul leaps up and shoves him back against the wall. Pinned and unable to move, Anakin slides his two blades in towards the center of Maul, along the way severing all of Maul's fingers, leaving only his two thumbs. I guess he should have had a cross guard that probably would have stopped that. Anakin slices the handle down the middle, disarming Maul, who, still rearing in pain, stumbles back. Anakin steps towards him. You were right about one thing. Death does swallow us all. He points at him with one of his sabers, and it will swallow both you and me alike. But the difference is, when my day comes, I- ah! Ah! Anakin was so distracted with his speech that he didn't realize Maul was levitating off one of his sabers that was on the ground in front of him. Maul fires lightning at Anakin that knocks the remaining saber out of his hand and sends him flying back. The energy pumps out of Maul's fingerless hands and straight into Anakin's body. Anakin, who has already had his nervous system fried in the first movie, is now completely paralyzed and he's just a helpless mass of quivering jelly against Maul's dark lightning. Maul screams in rage, just pumping all of his hatred into this lightning to barbecue Anakin alive. Until with one last roar, he hits Anakin with a final spray of the lightning before collapsing to his hands and knees. Maul is near the point of exhaustion, having thrown so much of his strength into that lightning. Anakin is also seriously messed up there. Both of them are struggling to rally their strength. Out of the corner of his eye, Maul spots his saber and slowly begins to claw his way towards it. Anakin is also trying to rise above this sea of absolute agony that he's feeling. Maul reaches his saber and manages to pick it up by sandwiching it between his two palms. He staggers to his feet and fumbles to switch it on. A very difficult thing to do when you only have thumbs. But he finally manages and turns back towards his enemy and freezes on the spot. Anakin is on his feet bracing himself against a pillar and clutching his raw stump of a hand. But what stops Maul in his tracks is the look on Anakin's face. A look unlike any that we have seen on his face before. A look of pure hatred. His eyes are almost black. His teeth are gritted in anger. It's almost as if a completely different person is wearing Anakin's face. For a split second, Maul is frozen in shock and a tiny spark of fear flashes in his eyes until Maul shakes it off and moves on Anakin. He only takes one step when Anakin's remaining hand thrusts out. Maul is seized by the throat immediately, and as Anakin's fingers tighten into a claw, we hear the muscles in Maul's throat beginning to cave in. He drops his saber and as he is levitated slowly into the air, sputtering for breath and twitching like a fish on a hook, we can see the life being choked out of Maul by the second. His mouth drops open, his eyes roll back in his head, and in the last second before life is completely choked out of him, Anakin's hand falls, and Maul smacks down on the ground and crumples over. Anakin limps over towards him. On the way, picking up Maul's saber, he takes a moment to inspect it. This grabs Maul's attention. Anakin's eyes move down to Maul's legs. He raises the saber up above his head, and with one last swing, brings it down. Yeah! 
Outside, Talon pauses in mid-fight with Obi-Wan. I sense it too. Your brother has been defeated. You're alone now. Talon hovers on the spot for a moment, like a leaf on the ocean, directionless. Which path you take is up to you now, only you. Talon shoots a bolt of lightning up at the ruptured generator that was blocking the walkway, and it explodes. The shockwave hits Obi-Wan, knocking him forward. She kicks his saber away from him and slices him across the chest and belly. Ah! He drops down, clutching his wound. It's bad, but shallow enough so as not to be fatal. Talon puts her saber directly under Obi-Wan's chin. She stares down at him, and he stares back. And without a word, she turns and walks away. And like a shadow in the night, she vanishes. A ship lands on a desolate planet in a lonely part of Separatist space. The door open and out steps Padme with the handler. Where are they? You said they'd be here. She looks up and sees a speck of light in the sky, slowly approaching. It grows inside and becomes a spaceship that lands a short distance away. The handler turns and walks back into the ship. Where are you going? You're inside Separatist space. How much further you go is up to them. Good luck. He takes off and flies away. Three Separatist officers exit the ship and approach. She swallows hard and then walks to meet them. So, you wish to defect? I'd rather defect than wait to be arrested. I've passed a lot of intel to you guys, and I can still be useful to you. I have contacts, old allies of my family that can be beneficial. First things first, your handler told us that you had one last piece of intel for us. About some of our contacts in danger? It's just one, actually. Count Dooku. He raises an eyebrow. Count Dooku, you say. Padme nods. Excuse us for a moment. The Separatist officers walk a few steps away and talk among themselves. What do you think? I'm not sure if I believe her. She wouldn't be trying to defect if they weren't coming after her. And if they're onto her, they could be onto him as well. I agree. We must warn Dooku. Just to be sure. We can't risk one of our biggest assets. What about her? She's a loose end. She's already in deep with us. There's no going back for her. I don't see any risk in giving her asylum. And we will need more contacts now that Naboo has been lost. All right then. He turns back. Lady Padme, please come aboard. She breathes a sigh of relief and follows them towards the ship. Ah! Republic commandos appear in the distance. Stop the engines! The clones fire back as the officers run on board, and as the clones engage the commandos, the Separatist shuttle blasts off and disappears into the sky, and the leader approaches Padme's body and rolls her over onto her back. Ouch! You said that fake blast was gonna sting, but you didn't say it would sting that much. Sorry about that, it had to look real. The commando helps her up. Good work, you handled that like a pro. Yoda appears and smiles at her. Very good, very good. In your debt, the Republic is. Surprise! Padme was working as a double agent the whole time. A while back, Padme was approached by some of the Separatist agents trying to recruit her as a spy for them. She, of course, went and reported this to the Jedi Council because she's not a traitor. But Yoda saw an opportunity in this. See, just like in the actual prequel movies, the Jedi in this do suspect that there's a traitor high up in the government. But unlike the Jedi in the movies, who do nothing really to investigate that, here they actually do. And they've traced back all of the suspicious activity to Count Dooku. Because remember, Dooku is Palpatine's second in command, so a lot of Palpatine's schemes are done through him. So they've linked all this suspicious activity back to Dooku. But the only way they can know for sure if he is in contact with the other side is to plant some information on the other side and to see if it gets back to him. So they've had Padme pretending to go along with being a Separatist spy, feeding them information about the Republic, real information, but nothing serious enough to cause major damage, but enough to convince the Separatists that she really is spying for them. And when Yoda appeared in her room earlier, it was to tell her that the time is right to plant the fake intel to see if Dooku reacts to it. By informing the Separatists that Dooku will soon be arrested, the Jedi can now watch Dooku, and if he tries to flee the planet, that means he is in contact with the Separatist, he has been warned, and he really is a traitor. But in order to make that intel seem legit, Padme needed to actually defect, 
as a real spy would if their cover was blown in those circumstances. So not only has she taken a huge risk in being a double agent and in defecting, because one wrong move she would have been dead, so that took a lot of guts. But hey, that's the kind of chick Padme is. And in this, Padme has also really helped to tighten the net on Palpatine. Back at Coruscant, Palpatine and Dooku receive a call from Obi-Wan telling them that they've captured Maul but Talon escaped and Mace Windu has been killed. Palpatine isn't concerned about Talon but is glad that Maul was captured and he puts on his fake grief routine about Windu. He tells Obi-Wan that he'll inform the Jedi Council so that they can begin funeral preparations for him. He ends the call and turns to Dooku, telling him to now go and call Moff Tarkin and tell him that the plan worked and he can take over the Separatists now. Dooku does so on a special hologram device, one that's secure and untraceable that nobody can hack. Palpatine sinks back into his chair and he grins gleefully at his own diabolical meddlings. Elsewhere, deep inside a Separatist bunker, Moff Tarkin stands in a conference room as a collection of other officers slowly file in and take their seats. So what's this all about, Tarkin? Gentlemen, I'm glad you could all be here. Today, hurry up and get to the point. What's the big news? My apologies. Today, Darth Maul has been captured by the Jedi. That grabs everyone's attention. Well, that's good. That's very good. Now we don't have to suck up to that stupid Zabrak or his sister anymore. And I have decided that our first action as a new ruling body of the Separatists is to negotiate a ceasefire with the Republic. A few waiters enter the room and distribute glasses of champagne around the table to everyone. You decided. Since when do you give the orders around here? If Maul is gone, the leadership falls to the highest ranking officer, which is me. Hell, Tarkin, you're the lowest ranking fool in this room. Tarkin raises his glass. You're right, of course. May I propose a toast to my promotion to the position of Grand Moth? Now wait just a minute. Tarkin skulls his drink and finishes by smashing the glass on the floor. As it breaks, all of the waiters whip out blasters and start shooting. <laughs> The former Grand Moff is blubbering on the floor. Tarkin takes a blaster from one of the waiters and approaches. The age of Republic and Separatist is over. This is the age of an empire. Behind enemy lines in Separatist space, the cloaked Republic ship that Yoda and the Republic commandos used to follow Padme to the meeting is heading back to Coruscant. The Separatist officers have called in a bunch of starships to find the commandos who attacked them, so Yoda has told them to hide in a nearby nebula until it's safe to come out. They cut all the power and go silent, so they can pass as just a piece of space junk while a starship passes by scanning the nebula. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief as it moves away. There it goes. If we gun it out of the nebula, we can have the hyperdrive ready to go in about 60 seconds. 60 seconds is an eternity when there's a separatist starship on your tail. We should wait until we're positive that they've all gone. Yoda nods in agreement. Alright then, we wait. Meanwhile, Anakin and Obi-Wan ship has returned back to Coruscant, and Maul has been locked up in a special prison built for Force-sensitive criminals. But they are keeping Maul sedated and in an induced coma just to be safe. They also brought back the Mandalorian iron with them. Anakin is in a hospital having a robotic hand attached to replace the one he lost. Next to him is Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is bandaged around his midsection where Talon cut him. They are both staring out the window at the city skyline, lost in thought. That is until the medical droid that's tending Anakin nudges him a little bit too hard and he jolts in discomfort. You alright over there? Yeah, it's just this droid's prodding. Yes, but are you alright? Anakin takes a heavy breath. As well as can be expected, I'm just glad that we got him. I'm sorry you had to see Master Windu die like that. It's always a huge tragedy to lose such a great Jedi. But to see it happen right in front of you, I can only imagine. But he's with the Force now. Anakin bows his head. Yes, he is. I'm glad you're alright. That Maul is a powerful Sith. Even during my duel with Talon, I could still feel the dark side echoing out of that room. I've never sensed anything quite like that before. Not even when I met him back on Alderaan. Do you really think that she's losing on purpose? What? Padme, with our game. Do you really think she's losing just because she wants to spend time with me? Obi-Wan smiles. Yes, I do. Anakin lets a cheeky grin sneak out, and Obi-Wan sees. Ah, there he is. Just don't let it go to your head, because you'll never be as handsome as me. They both share a laugh as the sun sets in the distance. 
In the Chancellor's suite, Dooku bursts in in a panic. He's just gotten word from the Separatist officers that the Jedis are after him, the information that Padme planted. Dooku is freaking out and Palpatine tells him to calm down and hands him a hollow device. There's a safe house on this world. It's off the grid, they won't find you there. Just go there and keep your head down until you hear from me. Take the secure radio with you so we have a way to communicate. But I'm a marked man now. The Jedi will always be after me. But the Jedi won't always be around. Their time is rapidly running out. But well, what about Maul? He's sedated now, but when they wake him up... They won't wake him up until they're ready to have their trial. And he won't survive long enough for that. People die in comas every day of the week. It's under control. But if you get caught here, things will get really complicated. Just take the radio, hide at the safe house, and I'll tell you when it's safe to return. Now you better go while you still can. Dooku rushes off to jump on his ship and leave the planet. Back in the nebula, another Separatist ship passes by. How many is that now? 16 ships in the last 10 hours. But they're not scanning the nebula anymore, so I think they've given up looking for us. But they're still flying past and their ship's going in both directions. It's very strange. Maybe they're delivering supplies and we just happen to be in the middle of their route. Maybe, but the weird thing is every ship that's heading deeper into Separatist space looks like it's clone controlled. But the ships heading out towards the Republic border are controlled by the systems that allied with the Separatists. Do you think it's a new attack? An attack where they're putting themselves as the tip of the spear? That will be a first. Usually they keep the clones on the front line and the guys from the systems hide behind them. Why would they pull the clones back from the border and replace them with ships from the systems? It doesn't make any sense. Yoda ponders this for a moment. Keep a record. We should. That's a good idea. We should keep a list of the ships and what directions they're heading. There's definitely something going on. Dooku's ship is racing through space with a Star Destroyer on its tail. When he gets caught in their tractor beam, no, 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 no! A transmission comes in from the destroyer. Count Dooku, in the name of the Senate and the Jedi Order, you are under arrest for treason to the Republic. Lower your shields and prepare to be boarded. Dooku crumples over in defeat when the secure radio next to him starts beeping. The next evening, Palpatine is addressing the War Council and is playing a hollow message from Grand Moff Tarkin as the new leader of the Separatists with his offer of a peace treaty. Anakin is waiting outside since he's not a member of the Jedi Council, so he's not allowed in, since it's only like VIPs that are in the war room. As he waits outside, he inspects his new robotic hand as his mind turns to his battle with Maul. How quickly he was able to defeat Maul once he summoned the appropriate power. He had only ever felt that amount of power once before back during the Battle of Alderaan, and although he has never admitted it to anyone, he can now admit it to himself. He liked it. Anakin feels a swell of shame build inside him as he admits this to himself. He's a Jedi, he's not supposed to enjoy power like that. But at the same time, look at what's resulted. When he embraced the power on Alderaan, he saved millions of lives. When he embraced it again, he defeated Maul, and now the Separatists are seeking peace. He may have just single-handedly ended the war and saved maybe even billions of lives. How could that be wrong? How could that be the dark side? The doors to the war room open and the attendees file out. Anakin spins eagerly to see them. And when he sees the look on Obi-Wan's face, his heart sinks. What happened? I'm sorry, Anakin. What happened? The Jedi Council rejected the offer of a peace treaty. It takes every fiber of self-control that Anakin can muster to not break out into an angry rant right there on the spot. You have to understand that the council, Anakin turns and angrily stomps out of the Jedi Temple. Obi-Wan follows after him. Palpatine exits the war room and then follows Obi-Wan in tow. Obi-Wan calls after him. Anakin, wait, wait. He ignores him and keeps walking. Anakin, stop. He stops. Palpatine steps up beside Obi-Wan. Let me talk to him. I'll try to settle him down. Oh, of course, Chancellor. Palpatine gestures towards his space limo, and he and Anakin jump in. Obi-Wan watches as they fly away. I can't believe it. After all that, Windu is dead. I lost my hand. Obi-Wan was almost cut in half. My entire squad was killed back on Naboo. And now all of that means nothing? Anakin sinks back into his chair. Just tell me one thing. Did everyone else in the war room agree with the Jedi Council? Did the politicians and the generals also want to reject the peace treaty? Palpatine shakes his head. No, everyone else wanted to sign, but they, they blocked the proposal again. Yes.
Like Obi-Wan said earlier, the Jedi Council are worried that if they make a ceasefire, that will create a pocket in the galaxy where the dark side can grow unchallenged and in the end come back maybe even stronger than it already is. So they want to push on until the dark side is completely removed from the galaxy. Also, and more importantly, they can sense that even though Maul has been captured and Dooku has been exposed as a traitor, the dark side is still as strong as it was before. In fact, it's even a little bit stronger. So this just makes makes them even more sure that they have to keep fighting and that they can't make a ceasefire. And they're right, the dark side is stronger than it was before, but what they don't know is it's because Palpatine is the real mastermind. See, this is the web of deception that Palpatine has carefully woven around everyone. Now you can say maybe if Yoda or Mace Windu could have been there, then perhaps they might have been able to see through this, but let's face it, probably not. You know, Anakin, this is our fault. What? It's our fault because we chose a half measure when we needed a full. It's clear to me now what needs to happen. We've removed all the obstacles to peace on the Separatist side. Now we need to remove the obstacles to peace on our side. What do you mean? We have to destroy the Jedi. Anakin shifts in his seat uncomfortably. I'm sorry, Chancellor. I don't think I heard you properly. Yes, you did. He leans forward. Search your feelings, my young friend. You know it to be true. We can never have peace as long as the Jedi Council keeps blocking any attempt to make it. No, no, the Jedi have been guardians of peace and justice for over a thousand generations. And yet we face a war without end because of them. Whatever the Jedi were, that's not what they are now. We don't need Jedi to end this war. We need soldiers. And a soldier's first duty is to protect lives. So tell me, soldier, how will you protect life when this is built? He brings up the hologram of the Death Star. They're getting ready to build this right now. You remember, how are you going to protect the Republic from that? How? I... I don't know. We have a chance to end this war now before it comes to that. But once that chance is gone, it's gone. Anakin looks out the window of the car as if searching for an answer out there. Don't talk, just listen. Tomorrow is the funeral for Mace Windu. Every Jedi in the temple will be there and every Jedi close enough to return for the funeral will be there too. And every single one of them will file past his body and place their lightsaber down beside his coffin as a sign of respect, as is the custom whenever a member of the Jedi Council dies. They won't let me or anyone else who's not a Jedi into the funeral hall, but they will let you in. He opens a case next to him and takes out what looks like Anakin's lightsaber. This is a replica of your Jedi weapon, but with one important difference. When triggered, it will overcharge and explode in a blast of saber energy that will in turn trigger all of the other lightsabers around it, which will create a chain reaction that will vaporize the entire funeral hall and everyone that's in it. He reaches over and puts the replica saber into Anakin's cloak for him. I could arrest you right now for this. Yes, you could, but I'm willing to do whatever needs to be done to protect the Republic. What happens to me doesn't matter. The limo slows to a stop. Palpatine points at the Death Star. Now, why don't you take a long, hard look at this hologram? Because the reality is, if we don't get peace, that will be the last thing that any of us see. Billions of lives are hanging in the balance, Anakin. Billions of people. People who will either live or die by what you decide to do tomorrow. Please make the right choice. Anakin exits the vehicle and hovers on the spot as the convoy departs behind him. Anakin begins to walk through the street. As clouds slowly gather overhead and rain begins to fall, Anakin doesn't even notice because he has disappeared inside himself. As the words of the Chancellor flow through his mind, He continues walking, step by step, through the streets of Coruscant. The words of his friend and old master, Obi-Wan, flow through his mind, as do the words of Yoda and all of his Jedi tutors throughout his training. Faces start appearing. He sees the faces of every single trooper that has died under his command. He knew them all, every single one by name. Now they're all dead. Other faces begin to appear. Friends he has, people he has known, but mostly he sees Padme, one face that he definitely doesn't want added to the others that he will never see again. His feet drag to a stop. He looks up and finds himself right in the middle of a war memorial that remembers all of those who have been killed in the Clone Wars so far. It is gigantic. The memorial stretches on seemingly forever. And in that moment, he knows what he has to do. He knows what he has to be. The guards in the prison that is holding Maul get a surprise when Chancellor Palpatine walks in. 
Chancellor, what brings you down here? I'd like to see the prisoner. I don't know if that's a good idea, sir. Are you refusing the order of your commander-in-chief? Um, no, no, sir. Then open the door and take me to him. He turns to his bodyguards. Wait outside. The guard leads him into the room where Maul is being kept, on the other side of a glass wall. By the force, where is he? A hole has been cut in the floor and Maul is gone. The other guards run in. Sound the alarm! Cancel that! Sir? You're wasting your time. I can't even sense his residual presence. He's already long gone, probably approaching the edge of Republic space by now. And I don't want anyone to know he's gone yet. Look, Chancellor, I have to report this. Palpatine turns to look at them, and with piercing black eyes, he stares into their very souls. You all have weak minds. You will kill each other. Under the power of this advanced Sith mind trick, each guard's eyes blacken and they fly at each other and begin beating each other to death with their bare hands. Palpatine rips the door of the cell open with a force, runs over and jumps down the hole in the floor, leading to the level underneath. A couple other guards are unconscious nearby. They've been shot with a blaster set on stun. There's one, set for stun. <laughs> Palpatine snaps both of their necks with a force, then kneels over the nearest guard. Using some kind of mysterious Sith Lord technique, he starts doing a kind of force CPR, keeping the guy's heart beating while also stretching tendrils of dark force energy into the guy's brain. The guard jolts violently and his eyes suddenly snap open. His face twists into an unnatural and creepy expression. With Palpatine trapping this guy halfway between life and death, he is able to pluck from his mind his last memory before he was stunned unconscious. And Palpatine sees Talon aiming a blaster at him. Talon has rescued her brother. Palpatine, now having the information he wanted, releases the guard from his grip and he drops back into death again. One thing that was seriously lacking in Palpatine's character in the prequel movies was the lack of how dangerous he was. I mean, in the originals, he is built up as the ultimate Sith, one that is extremely powerful and that is not to be underestimated. However, in the prequels, the only thing that separates him from other Force users is that he can use lightning, but even other characters can do that. There's really nothing in the prequels that show why he is the ultimate Sith Master. Even his ability to foresee the future is reduced to just being a device to compensate for bad writing. I like Red Letter Media's take on the Emperor. His ability to shoot lightning is just one of the many, many powerful things that he knows how to do. But in the prequels, we should have gotten a glimpse of Palpatine's true power and we never did. This is something that I'm going to explore more in the Revenge of the Sith video, but I just want to demonstrate here that Palpatine is someone who has a huge library of different things he can do. Not only is his Sith mind control strong enough to force people to fight each other to the death with their bare hands, but he can also bring someone back from the brink of death and dangle them around on that thread at will, plucking memories from a half-dead mind. Now that is pretty damn powerful and pretty damn evil, and it's a talent worthy of the Emperor. The moment of truth has arrived. Anakin waits outside the Jedi funeral hall. Now, of course, there is a war on, so not every Jedi is able to show up for Windu's funeral, but as many as can, do. Anakin sees Palpatine approaching with his envoy. Well, you're waiting for me, and I haven't been arrested yet, so I guess that only means one thing. I'll do it. You made the right choice, my friend. I'll send someone for you with an urgent message after you've placed the saber down. That will give you a reason to leave before it happens. Your security looks bigger than usual. For good reason. Maul escaped last night. He escaped? We haven't told anyone yet. What does it matter? Well, that's the end of our chance for a peace treaty. As soon as he makes his way back to the clones again, we'll be back where we started. No, not at all. Tarkin has already replaced the clone ships on the border with his own. If Maul tries to get past them back in a separate space, it'll be the last thing he ever does. So since he can't get back and he can't stay in our space, he'll have no choice but to flee to the outer ring. And then we can take our time to hunt him down. No, our mission is unchanged, as is the ever-narrowing window of opportunity. Actually, this works out better for us. Now we have an easy scapegoat to pin this event to. But don't you worry about that, you just leave those details up to me. So long as you follow through on your end, I have one condition. What's that? Obi-Wan is already inside. When you send your messenger, you'll ask for both him and me to come. 
Of course, of course. He's a good man. We don't want him caught up in this. Don't lie to me, Chancellor. You're a very good liar, but you can't lie to me. Anakin's eyes narrow and he sends a probe of force towards Palpatine's mind. Palpatine is aware of this, but allows Anakin to do so. Through the force, Anakin is effectively scanning Palpatine's mind to make sure that he knows he is telling the truth in what he's about to say. I want your word, Chancellor. I want your word that you will send for both him and me. Palpatine looks him square in the eye without blinking. I promise you, I will send for both of you. Anakin is satisfied, and without another word, turns and walks into the funeral hall. As he enters, he is momentarily shocked at how jam-packed it is with Jedi. He knew that it would be, but looking around the room at everyone's faces, sends a dagger of guilt plunging into his heart. He brushes it aside and just tries to focus on the task at head. There is a line of Jedi filing past Windu's coffin and placing their sabers down. Anakin joins the line, and tries to just look down at the floor in front of him. When Obi-Wan appears, Anakin, I was looking for you. I came by quarters last night to see if you were alright, but you weren't there. I went out for a walk. I just needed to clean my head. It's been a very difficult time for all of us, but especially you. But I'm proud of you, Anakin. You know that, right? Training you to become a Jedi, I consider to be one of the greatest things I've ever done. Obi-Wan. I know, I know, you don't like it when I talk like this, but it's true. They both look towards Windu's coffin. Did you know he was a gardener? Who? Mace Windu? Yeah, he was a gardener. No way. I'm serious, he was a gardener. He didn't tell many people though, I think he was a bit embarrassed, but he loved it. He said it helped him to keep his center. Why do you think so much of his teaching included gardening metaphors? Actually, he did use gardening metaphors a lot. Well, now you know why. Anakin breaks a slight smile. I remember one time I was visiting him and he was pruning back a plant. Really just going to town on this little thing, just chopping away. And I said, hey stop, you're gonna kill it. And he looked at me and said, no, 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 it only looks that way. You know, come back in a few weeks and it'll be twice as high and three times as strong. And I did and he was right, it was. Then he turned to me and he said, see, the only difference between a Jedi and a gardener is a Jedi prunes with a lightsaber. They both chuckle a little bit. Strange thing to say, I know, but I understand what he means now. You know, sometimes being a Jedi means we have to do things that initially seem hurtful, but in the long run, it's for the best. Like the council rejecting the ceasefire. It might seem hurtful now, but it's just pruning. In the long run, it'll make the tree stronger. Obi-Wan looks to the line. I better leave you to it, it's almost your turn. I'll talk to you afterwards. He goes to leave when Anakin calls after him. Obi-Wan, he turns back. You know, pruning, cutting off tree branches, that's a really violent act. It's very traumatic for the plant, but if in the long run it makes the tree stronger, that means it's the right thing, yeah? I think so, yes. Some trees just can't grow without it. Obi-Wan leaves. As Anakin's turn in the line comes, he unhooks the replica saber with his robot hand and stares at it. Some trees can't grow without it. He places the saber down and resolutely turns and makes his way back to Obi-Wan. He makes it half of the way towards him when Palpatine's messenger intercepts him. Master Skywalker, the Chancellor has requested your help on an urgent matter. Very well, I'll collect uh, Master Kenobi and meet you outside. No, no, no. The Chancellor only asked for you. You must be mistaken. He sent for me and Master Kenobi. I'm afraid not. The Chancellor was very specific about it. I'm to bring you and only you. Anakin pauses for a moment. You will collect both of us together. I will collect both of you together. Well then you should inform Master Kenobi, he's just over there. The messenger does so and leads the two of them outside. They reach outside and the fresh air hits Anakin like a slap in the face. On the fringes of the galaxy, Talon pilots a ship through the stars. Behind her, the injured Maul is slowly waking up from being sedated. Suddenly, he jolts awake with a roar. Ah! 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 Talon puts the ship on autopilot and runs in. It's alright, you're safe here. Talon? Where am I? Don't worry, you're safe. I'm taking us somewhere we can hide. Hide? From the Jedi? From everyone. 
I tried to get us back in a separate space, but some of our own ships fired on us. Tarkin ships. That would be my guess. I had to go into hyperspace to get us away. It doesn't matter. If the clones see me again, it won't matter if Tarkin is in charge. They'll follow me. Not if you can't stand on your own two feet. Literally. You came back for me. You didn't have to do that. I couldn't just leave you on Coruscant. Sidious would have made sure that you didn't survive long enough to talk. I had to get you out of there. That was foolish. You went right into the lion's den. It's not just that. There's been a shift in the dark side. I don't know if you can sense it yet, but it's there. Where are we going exactly? To a place in the outer rim? A place that can make you whole again? Legs? Fingers? And we'll be safe there. Maul looks at her. There has been a shift in the dark side, but there's also been a shift in you. Talon looks back at him. You should get some rest. We still have a journey ahead of us. Back on Coruscant, a few days have passed since what the news is now calling the Black Sunset because the bomb went off just as the sun was setting over Coruscant and the smoke formed from the blue plasma burning through the stone walls of the funeral hall created a thick, low-hanging black cloud that loomed ominously over the capital, creating the Black Sunset after which the event was named. Palpatine has been busy with his tricks, and he's convinced everyone that the attack was the work of Separatist loyalists, the same people who freed Maul from prison. And the new Grand Moff Tarkin, in joining with Palpatine in condemning this attack, has gone a long way in the ceasefire between the Separatist and the Republic being accepted and passed by the Senate. Which, with the Jedi Council out of the picture, Palpatine has been quick to rush through the Senate. And a condition of the new peace treaty is that the Jedi are cut out of any involvement in politics. They are still considered the guardians of the Republic, but they no longer have any power to block laws from being passed or to get involved in the government at all. Yoda steps through the rubble of the former Jedi Temple, which collapsed in around the funeral hall when it exploded. By his side are Obi-Wan, as well as a few other Jedi who were fortunate enough not to have made it back to Coruscant in time for the funeral. Yoda is unusually quiet. The archives were destroyed in the collapse, but I estimate there are still around 400 Jedi that were off-world when this occurred. 400 Jedi is enough for us to start over, to rebuild. And now that the war is over, over, you say? Over? No, Master Kenobi. Not over. He kicks at some of the rubble in front of him. The work of a new enemy this is. One that has remained hidden until now. A new enemy? You don't think this was Separatist loyalists? Master Yoda and I have talked about this at length. We have been sensing a disturbance in the Force here on Coruscant for quite some time. We believed that it was Count Dooku working against us. But even now, after his death, the disturbance is still here. Clearly, Coruscant isn't safe for us anymore. If we regroup our remaining Jedi here, the same thing could happen again. So what then? We regroup our remaining Jedi, but we do it discreetly, silently, off-world, until we can uncover who this new enemy is. But if there's a threat here, it's a threat to the government too. We should stay to protect it. We're no longer a part of the government. Our hands are tied. But don't worry. We still have friendly eyes and ears around that can keep us informed of any developments here. But for now, we must regroup off-world and in secret. Anakin knows a few places off the grid we could use as rallying points. I could ask him. What? Told you. He has not. Told me what? We thought Anakin would have talked to you by now. I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, but... Anakin's quit being a Jedi. What? He chose to leave the Jedi Order. He said, now that the war is over, he just wants to have a normal life. I'm still not used to seeing you in non-Jedi clothes. Maybe I picked this outfit to put you off your game. Or you picked it because it's your new work clothes. And it's working, by the way. I just can't imagine you working on a space freighter. Not just working on a space freighter. I'm the navigator on a space freighter. No, my father didn't fight in the wars. He was a navigator on a spice freighter. See? Told ya. Are you sure you're going to be okay with this? Living as a civilian? Does this answer your question? He types his move into the console. <coughs> Padme looks at the board in amazement. No, that didn't just happen. She looks up at him. I was wondering how long it would take you to make that move. I figured we didn't need to play this game anymore. Well, what can I say? You got me. You got me. They exit the diner arm in arm, and we see that they're actually on Alderaan, Padme's home world, and the streets are full of people celebrating the return to their world. Padme looks at her watch. We better get moving, it looks like the coronation is about to begin. 
Remember how I said that the prince had been refusing the title of being the king of Alderaan because he didn't feel like he could accept that until he had helped to return his people back to Alderaan because only then would he feel like he's actually earned it? Well, apart from Palpatine, he was the one who pushed the hardest to get the peace treaty signed because he knew it would result in his people's return back to Alderaan. And it has. So now he feels comfortable in accepting that title and he is being crowned as the new king. And this event is sort of doubling as a massive homecoming party for all of Alderaan. Anakin and Padme hustle down the busy streets to the palace. The guards there know who they are and they let them in as VIPs. Because Anakin is the saviour of Alderaan after all. They bring them into the VIP section and Padme spots her brother Owen and sister-in-law Beru on the other side of the room. Anakin however spots Palpatine up in a booth staring down at him. Padme excitedly tugs at Anakin's arm. There's Owen and Beru, over there. You go ahead, I'll be right with you. She hurries over to them. Palpatine gestures to Anakin for him to come up and speak to him. Palpatine's security lets him through. He goes up the stairs and reaches the booth. Palpatine dismisses all the other people there so that he and Anakin can be alone. When they are, he takes out a pouch full of those vials of medicine that Anakin needs and he places them down on the table beside Anakin. I realize you must have been running low, so I brought you a new batch. Hopefully you won't need those for much longer though. Your suit's coming along nicely. In fact, we've been able to incorporate uh, some of that special iron into it for you. Anakin doesn't pick up the pouch. He just leaves it on the table and stares at Palpatine coldly. I'm sorry I didn't speak to you after the Black Sunrise incident, but my security rushed me off the world as soon as it happened. Palpatine turns and looks out over the sea of people. Look at that. Life has returned to this world, and it's all thanks to you, Anakin. And you as well. In fact, I think a lot of this had more to do with you than it did with me. Anakin looks over the balcony and sees Padme with Owen and Beru. She is smiling from ear to ear. I haven't seen her smile like that since the first day I met her. I'm glad to see that smile again. In fact, I see a lot of smiles out there, but I wonder how many would still be smiling if they knew the foundation that this new universe of yours is built on. Yes, the universe is strange like that. When it comes to growth, the love act and a cruel act can be one and the same thing. That's what Mace Windu believed, wasn't it? Anakin turns. And how, exactly, do you know what he believed? Palpatine turns to face him. I know many things, my young friend. Yes, you do. There are many beings in the universe that can resist Jedi mind tricks, that can block force users from sensing their intentions or sensing their mindsets, but there are very few people that can open their minds entirely to a Jedi, have a Jedi peer into every corner of their mind, and yet still manage to conceal something, still manage to lie without being detected. Go on. To do that would take not just a person who is force sensitive, but a person who is trained, highly skilled, and there's only two types of people in the galaxy that are skilled and trained force users, and I know you're not a Jedi. Go on. I mean, Maul and Talon can't be the only ones, and even then, they would have had to learn from someone, perhaps someone who is still alive, someone with a great deal of patience, who knows how to use their skills to manipulate and get everything in place until the time is right. Speak your mind, my young friend. Anakin looks out at all the smiling people before locking eyes with Palpatine. Can you teach me? Palpatine takes a deep breath. They say when the student is ready, the teacher appears, and here I am. So yes, it would be my honor, my young apprentice. Well, there we have it guys. That is the conclusion of my Attack of the Clones fan fiction rewrite. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. I really did enjoy making it too. It was so much fun. And yes, there will be Revenge of the Sith. Yes, I do have most of it planned out. I've just got to work out the little, you know, fine details of connecting everything. But there's going to be some really exciting moments in that of Anakin really becoming Darth Vader and hunting down the Jedi across the galaxy. And we're going to get to see the birth of like Luke and Leia and how all that happens and how they get separated and so I want to thank all of you guys for your support and until that time when Revenge of the Sith is finished then I hope you subscribe to my channel and check out everything that's there. I am Bandit, this is Bandit Incorporated and until next time I'll see you guys in the comments. Welcome to what Star Wars Attack of the Clones should have been. This is a continuation of the story that was started back in my What Phantom Menace Should Have Been video, as this is supposed to be a complete alternate history of the prequels. Now it's not a requirement that you have seen my rewrite of The Phantom Menace, because I'll fill you in as we go, 
but obviously it will add more to the experience if you have seen it, as there's a number of elements from that story that carry over and influence things in this movie. And as I mentioned in the previous video, these fanfiction prequels are intended to primarily fit into the original movie trilogy. Although I have borrowed a few things from the expanded universe here and there, I'm mostly just focusing on the original movies. So forgive me if I accidentally step on some of the expanded universe lore, but apparently almost none of that exists anymore thanks to Disney, so I guess it doesn't matter. So then, with all of that out of the way, I give you Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. The invasion of Alderaan set off a blaze that now threatens to engulf the entire galaxy in total war. A conflict unlike any the Republic has faced before. The Clone Wars. Many systems have surrendered to the clones rather than risk conflict, while others have willingly allied with this new power as a means to rid themselves of Republic law. These systems in league with the clone armies, under the leadership of Darth Maul, call themselves the Separatists. Desperate to beat back the seemingly endless horde of clones, the Republic has authorized the creation of a galactic army to defend what remains of Republic space. Led by the Jedi Order, the first major battle of this army is now underway. A planetary-wide battle to seize back control of the vital world of Naboo, a world with the second largest reserves of Jantine in the galaxy, a naturally occurring nutrient that is vital for the creation of clones. If the Separatists seize control of these resources, the clone armies could multiply to numbers so vast that they would overrun Republic territory like a plague. This is a battle that the Republic cannot afford to lose. On the bridge of the command ship, we find Mace Windu leading the attack. The last of the destroyers is out of hyperspace. Scan the planet. The Separatist fleet is rallying to block us. Good. Fire on these coordinates and keep your eyes peeled for an opening. They're pulling ships from the west as reinforcements. Then that's where we'll send the first wave. Send the coordinates for them to come out of hyperspace. Send the nearest TIE fighter squads to clear a path to the planet's surface. The first wave is almost at the surface. Signal the second wave and move these destroyers in to form a perimeter. Keep the highway open, we'll funnel our dropships through it. Inside a galactic walker, we see Obi-Wan Kenobi. He makes a hologram call. Anakin, we're moving on the clone defenses on the northern side of the city. 
Lost a Fisto is approaching from the south. What's your situation? Anakin is cruising low in another dropship with his squad of troopers with him. Scanners are detecting something in the jungle to the west. That could be our Gentane mine. We'll have to approach on land to be sure. I'll send some TIE fighters to circle the jungle in case you need them. Be careful, my old Padawan. You too, my friend. The dropship hovers low when Anakin and his squad jump out and make their way into the jungle. Back with Obi-Wan, they are hammering clone defences at the city's edges. Master Fistu, we've broken through on the north side. We should be coming through the south in a moment. Then we'll meet you in the middle. A hooded figure slips through the crowds that step out. Obi-Wan is quickly approached by a few military types. He turns to Anakin, give my regards to your friends. I will. They hustle Obi-Wan away into a secure room so he can make his report to the War Council, which includes the Jedi Council, a few military generals, Prince Valium, Chancellor Palpatine, and Count Dooku. On the other side of the galaxy, Talon is training her saber fighting against a bunch of battle droids. Into the room walks Darth Maul. Very good. You've improved greatly. I just think of them as being that Jedi from Alderaan. Don't worry, your time will come. The dark side will deliver him to you, and then you will have your revenge. In the last movie, her and Obi-Wan had a fight, and she copped a serious thrashing. You heard about Naboo? Of course. By now the plans would have reached Coruscant. Do you think he believes it? That we're getting ready to build the Death Star without him? He'll want confirmation before he moves on it, but we should ready ourselves for our final battle with him. Do you think we can do it? Kill Sidious? Maybe. With great difficulty. But now that he's seen the plans, we're going to have to make a move before he does. I'm much better with the saber now, but against him? He doesn't even use a saber. I know. But we always knew it was going to come down to him or us. We have to ready ourselves nonetheless. As the sun sets over the city skyline of Coruscant, Anakin is meditating trying to cleanse his mind of the mental images of battle. When he senses someone approaching, he opens his eyes and turns around. Chancellor Palpatine, welcome home, my young friend. I'm greatly relieved to see you've returned safely. How are you feeling? Um... Anakin goes silent as a few Jedis walk past. I have transportation waiting if you would like a ride somewhere. Yes, thank you. They walk and they talk, just light chit-chat about this and that, until they reach Palpatine's space limousine waiting outside the Jedi Temple with a whole bunch of his bodyguards. After all, he is the Chancellor and there is a war on, so he's going to need a ton of security around him wherever he goes. He and Anakin jump in and fly off, followed by all the security. Now in private, Palpatine hands a small pouch to Anakin, who opens it to reveal a large collection of vials with a light blue liquid in them. Anakin's hand trembles ever so slightly as he opens one of the vials and drinks it. A few seconds later, his hand steadies. We have to keep you healthy, my young friend. Do you remember back in the last movie how Anakin had a ton of force energy transferred through him that completely fried out his nervous system? And you remember that the doc said that he would either recover completely and be okay, or he would eventually have to be put into an iron lung to regulate all his bodily functions for him. Well, Anakin is not okay. The damage done to him is beyond repair, and his body is gradually shutting down. But since Palpatine is such a wonderful guy, he has scientists working on a new experimental type of suit that can work as an iron lung, but will still allow Anakin to function. But since this is such a specialized type of equipment, it takes a fair amount of time to build it, and it's not quite ready yet. So in the meantime, Anakin is taking this medication just to help him get by. The medication doesn't fix his problem, it basically just suppresses the symptoms. And as his condition is deteriorating, he's needing to take more and more medication to keep going. And this presents a problem. Jedis are not allowed to use any kind of medication because the Council doesn't want Jedis to develop a dependency on drugs, for obvious reasons. So if a Jedi is not able to heal themselves just through their meditation and such, then they have to stop being a Jedi until they've fully healed up and off the medication. But the thing is, Anakin doesn't want to stop being a Jedi and stop fighting the war, because remember, he is called the savior of Alderaan. He is a war hero. People recognize him in the streets and thank him for saving their lives on Alderaan. 
And most importantly, he knows how badly Padme wants to return back to her home world. How badly she wants to see it free of the Separatist. But he can't help with that if he has to give up being a Jedi. So Palpatine has figured out a solution. He will get him the medication that he needs secretly so that he can keep functioning, keep fighting the war, and keep being a Jedi until his suit is ready. And no one will ever know. As far as everybody else is concerned, Anakin is keeping himself together with good old-fashioned Jedi meditation. So the drugs are allowing him to keep being a Jedi until his suit is ready. And in this, we also see the beginning of like a dependency between Anakin and Palpatine. Anakin thanks Palpatine for the medication and puts it in his bag. Palpatine turns to him slowly. You know, Anakin, I heard that you agree with my suggestion to draw up a peace treaty with the Separatists. Yes, I do. But I suppose the Council has good reasons for why they disagreed with your proposal. Disagreed? Oh yes, that was what we called it publicly. But a more accurate description would be they blocked the proposal. Blocked? Hmm, yes. Even though the majority of Senators were willing to support a peace treaty, they never got the chance to because it was blocked by the Jedi Council before it could be voted on. They can do that? Oh yes. Since the Council is intended to be a safeguard against corruption, one of the powers afforded to them is the power to block legislation. You remember they did the same thing when I tried to form a galactic army way before the war began. I remember. Thankfully though, they eventually came around and now we have our army. But waiting for them to come around certainly came at a price. Yes, it has. I fear that if we wait for them to come around this time, it might come to cost us more than we can afford. He presses a button and a mini hologram projector folds out. Anakin leans forward, looking at it. Master Kenobi found these on Naboo. It's a weapon capable of destroying an entire planet. And the Separatists are getting ready to build it. If they succeed, it's all over. We need to end the war now. Not later, but now. Anakin sits back, stunned. You understand that what I'm about to tell you must be kept in the utmost confidence. Of course. What if I told you there are those among the Separatists who also desire peace with the Republic? Many of the systems that allied themselves with the clones are being saddled with having to provide equipment for the war. It's put quite a strain on them, and they're becoming more than a little tired of it. Nah, it's incinerating everything around him. As Anakin dives into the air, he's able to throw up a force shield around him, enough to protect himself from the blast. As he hits the ground, a thick cloud of dust and debris cloak the entire area. On the surface, Obi-Wan walks into the now captured Separatist stronghold. He has to step over many dead clones to do this. As he does, he looks down at them and says, By the Force, I really wish they would just surrender. They were bred for combat, Master Kenobi. Surrender's not a concept they're familiar with. It's right this way. The trooper leads Obi-Wan into a control room and nods to some of the techno guys there that are hacking into the Separatist computers. And they bring up... An eerie silence falls over the room. Who else has seen these files? Just us. Make sure it stays that way until I tell you otherwise. Understood. At Coruscant, news of the Galactic Army succeeding in retaking Naboo has gotten people dancing in the street. This is the first real victory that the Republic has had against the Separatists since the war began. And Chancellor Palpatine is throwing a party in celebration with all the senators and politicians. One of which is Prince Valium. Since the invasion of Alderaan in the first movie, Prince Valium has overseen the welfare of his people as refugees. Most of his people have settled in temporary housing here on Coruscant. And the plight of the Alderanians in not being able to return home has become somewhat of a rallying cry as to why the Separatists need to be defeated. So that the people of Alderaan can return home. The prince's father took being driven from their homeworld very hard, and he eventually died a broken man, now leaving Valium to take on the mantle of king. However, Valium has repeatedly refused to accept the title of king because he doesn't feel like he can accept it until he is able to return his people to their homeworld. In his mind, only then will he have earned the crown. And since not everyone did succeed in fleeing Alderaan in the first movie, there are still little pockets of people scattered around the planet. So Valium has been working to coordinate these groups into like a mini resistance and a spy network that can send him information from behind enemy lines. In fact, it was through these Alderaan spies that the Republic figured out the importance of Gentane in the cloning process. 
So through this, the prince is kind of getting experience of what it's like to sort of run a rebellion. Skills that could be very useful that he could one day pass on to a certain somebody. Also in the room is Count Dooku, who is actually quite different in this version. He's not an ex-Jedi. In fact, he's not a Force user at all. What he is, is Chancellor Palpatine's political ally. Kind of like this dude in the prequel movies. You know, that dude, he was like in on Palpatine's plan. He wasn't a Sith, but he was a political ally and he was always there. And I guess that makes sense, because Palpatine would need political allies on his side to help him enact all these schemes. So in this version, Count Dooku is his chief ally in politics. In fact, Dooku is basically like the vice president. He's Palpatine's second in command. And through him, Palpatine does a lot of his shady deals. So Palpatine also keeps him around kind of like to be a fall guy. In case the Jedi ever start to catch on to him, he can be like, Nope, it was Dooku. Wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. Palpatine taps his wine glass with a spoon and silences the lively room and raises his glass for a toast. My dear friends, today is a historic day for the Republic, for it is a day that not only we will remember, but our enemies will too. It's a victory made possible by regular citizens of the Republic, regular people who joined the Galactic Army and decided to fight to protect the Republic, not just leaving it up to the Jedi, but decided to take their own fate into their own hands. Because they have a passion for what this glorious Republic stands for. And through that passion, they've gained strength. And through that strength, they've gained power. And through that power, they've gained a victory for us all. A victory that set us free from the chains of tyranny and oppression. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to propose a toast. Through victory, may our chains be broken. Through victory, may our chains be broken! In the Republic starships that are heading back from Naboo, Anakin is sitting with his head bowed when Obi-Wan enters the room. How are you feeling? Tired. Me too. But we did it. We took back Naboo. What were our casualties? Obi-Wan pauses. 20,000 dead on the surface, another 5,000 in orbit. Plus all of the Gungans. Yes, I heard. I'm sorry. This has to stop. Remember what Master Yoda said, the dark side feeds on war, and war feeds on all of us. And he's right, the most challenging state for a Jedi to be in is one of prolonged conflict. That's why I agree with the Chancellor. We should negotiate a truce with the Separatists. They keep their territory, we keep ours, but at least this fighting stops. If they honored their side of the agreement, which I doubt they would, and even if they do, we're not just fighting the Separatists, we're fighting the dark side. They're led by a Sith, you remember? If we made a truth that would create a pocket in the galaxy where the dark side can grow unchallenged and eventually come back maybe even stronger. Now we have to press on until the entire galaxy is wiped clean. And in the meantime, every living thing in the galaxy has to pay the price. Anakin, the dark side is like a raging fire. It's not enough to mostly extinguish it. Even if there's just a few sparks left, it can ignite again. We have to sacrifice today if we want to have a tomorrow. Obi-Wan looks at Anakin intently. How many of your men died? Anakin looks down at the floor. All of them. What? Yeah, like you said, I just hope it's worth it. The ship lands on Coruscant and Obi-Wan and Anakin populate the busy nightlife streets of Coruscant and ducks into the shadows of a narrow alley. Discreetly leaning against a wall, the figure makes a mark before moving back out into the streets and merging with the crowd again. As the figure passes a small garden area, in a barely discernible motion, drops a small package into the garden and continues on. The figure makes a big circle all the way around the block to return to the original spot and sees that the mark left now has an additional mark added, forming an X. On seeing this, the figure turns around, enters a different alley and moves to a drain pipe, reaching behind it, retrieving a different package attached by a magnet to the back of the pipe and stashes it inside his cloak before disappearing back into the shadows. This is what the spy world would call a dead drop with signal drops. When information needs to be exchanged, a pre-arranged spot is selected where it will be dropped. In this case, the garden. The one making the drop leaves the signal to the handler that they're about to make the drop, which is the mark on the wall, for the handler to see. The handler can then collect the package within only a minute or so of it having been left, and leaves another signal 
the second mark, to the spy telling them that he's got the package and that it's safe for the spy to go to the second drop, in this case the drain pipe, to collect their pay as well as information on where the next dead drop will be. In this way, a spy and a handler can pass information back and forth for years without ever actually meeting face to face. The spy might never even meet the handler at all. I don't know if anyone else finds that interesting at all, but I just find that kind of stuff fascinating. And it's going to come into play later, so keep it in the back of your brain. The figure makes its way back to a speeder, jumps in and pulls back the hood, revealing Padme. Back at the Battle of Naboo, Obi-Wan's forces are sieging the biggest Separatist stronghold in the city. Meanwhile, in the jungle, Anakin's squad has located the source of the signal they were detecting. Looks like the structure is underwater. Would be a good place to hide a Gentane mine. Anakin tells all of his men to remove their helmets to put on their breathing gear so that they can swim down there. And we see that these troopers are not clones like their Separatist opponents. They are just regular dudes that have joined the Galactic Army to take up the fight against the clones. I'm with Red Letter Media on this one. If there are to be clones, which... There has to be, because Luke did mention it in A New Hope. You fought in the Clone Wars? Then the clones should be fighting for the Separatists, and the Republic troops should be regular guys. That way you actually care if a trooper dies, because he probably has a family that he's leaving behind. And as we will see, that's going to be a necessary part as to why Anakin does what he does in this story, and eventually becomes Darth Vader. One of Anakin's soldiers was from Naboo before the clones attacked. The Gungans used to have a secret underwater city. No one ever knew where it was, but after the clones attacked, all the Gungans hid there. If this is that underwater city, they're probably all still down there now. But if the clones have already found it and taken it over, then this could be the Gentane mine that we're looking for. I guess we won't know until we get down there. But either way, I wouldn't expect a warm welcome. They put on their breathing gear and dive beneath the surface and swim down into the blackness below. Slowly lights appear in the watery depths and an orb containing the glowing city comes into view. They swim to an entrance and morph through the liquid substance that holds back the water of the swamp. Anakin and his troopers remove their breathing gear and look around. This is it. It's the Gungan city. Where is everybody? All the lights are on so somebody has to be here. Anakin suddenly snaps to attention. Ambush! He brings his hands together in a clapping motion, and in an instant, hundreds of objects from all around are levitated in front of them. They slam together, forming a wall of metal, rock, and steel. In the same instance, clones pop up from all over the place and unleash a volley of laser blasts. Everyone ducks behind the hovering wall that Anakin has pulled together. It starts to break apart from the heavy fire it's taken. Break cover on my mark, stand in 2x2 two two formation. Ready? Go! He force pushes the wall and it shatters apart, with pieces flying right back at all of the clones. They are showered in debris and have to duck out of the way. All the troopers charge them in twos, blasting away as they go. Anakin runs forward towards a group of clones. He ignites both of his lightsabers and dual wielding his weapons, he launches himself right into the middle of a big pile of clones. And like a spinning whirlwind of death, goes to work, sending arms and legs and heads flying left, right and centre. He is untouchable, he is so fast, so deadly, so lethal, they never even get a single shot off. Anakin retracts his lightsabers just in time for the last of the clones to hit the floor. We can see that Anakin has become battle-hardened by the war. Cutting down enemy has become just another day at the office for him. Outside, Anakin's troopers are finishing off the last of the clones. One of them that's climbed up on the rooftop to scout ahead says that he can see the mining site at the center of town along with all the Gungans. They hurry down the street into the town square where they indeed find the mining site as well as... No! They're dead! They're all dead! Ah! Every single Gungan in the entire universe was there. Now they're extinct. No more. <laughs> Who knows, you know, maybe one of those guys could have been a character that we might have known in Star Wars, but not going to happen because they are all 
dead. The troopers look on in horror at this huge pile of Gungan heads. As one of them steps closer, his foot presses down on a hidden plate in the ground. RUN! A huge mound of explosives that was hidden under the Gungan heads deton- We've been in contact with a high-ranking Separatist leader who is willing to make a deal with us. Who is he? Which leader? His name is Tarkin. Moff Tarkin? He's one of Darth Maul's inner circle. Why would he be willing to make a deal with us? Palpatine points at the hologram. Because of this. Tarkin's not a stupid man. He knows that if Darth Maul builds a weapon like this, it could just as easily be used on his own planet as it could be on one of ours. He'd like to avoid that. You see, we didn't find these plans on Naboo by chance. He left them there for us. Anakin starts to smile. You see where this is going, yes? He's going to help us capture Darth Maul. That's right, my young friend. With Maul out of the picture, he will rise to the position of Grand Moff Tarkin and take on the leadership. From then, he can come to us with an offer of peace. And the war ends. And the war ends. In fact, we've already agreed on many of the details of the peace treaty. The first one being the return of Alderaan. Anakin looks at him, startled. It's logical that we select a planet to be neutral so that the two sides can meet together in peace to negotiate. And what better planet than Alderaan? Now for the plan to work, we need Jedis that have been in the presence of both Darth Maul and his sister Talon previously, who would be able to sense their presence again. Obi-Wan and myself. That's right, on Alderaan you both came into close contact with them. Obi-Wan more so than me, but yes. So if the two of you succeed, we end the war. That is, assuming that you accept the mission. I absolutely accept. The limo slows to a stop in the street. You sure you want to be dropped here? Yes, I'm meeting some friends. Well, don't stay up too late. You leave first thing in the morning. Thank you, Chancellor. No, my young friend. Thank you. Anakin steps out of the car, and as Palpatine's envoy departs, he walks into a cantina. And there waiting for him is Owen, Baru, and of course, Padme. He greets them all, and Padme slides a drink over to him. Thank you. It's on me. He takes a drink and looks around. There's a lot of people out tonight. Everyone celebrating the liberation of Naboo. A droid waiter comes over and delivers a whole new round of drinks to them all. We didn't order that. Compliments of the patrons over there for your service to the Republic as a Jedi. A group across the room raise their glasses to Anakin. He gestures a thank you back to them. We should come out drinking with you more often. Maybe I should change clothes next time before I head out. It wouldn't matter. Everyone already knows your face. Yeah, you're the savior of Alderaan. Anakin takes another drink. Yeah, the Force willing, you guys will be home again, hopefully soon. Padme raises her glass, the Force willing. Even if we do get to go back, it won't ever be the same again. Sometimes I just wish we had not gotten involved. Well, we didn't really have a choice about being involved. The clones came down whether we liked it or not. Anakin finishes his glass. I have to go. They're shipping me out again tomorrow morning. So soon? You only just got back. It must be pretty important. How long do you think you'll be away for? Anakin looks at him with a slight raised eyebrow. He can't say, you know that. Sorry. Padme takes out a small device. You got time for a few moves before you go? Anakin chuckles. Sure. The two of them go over to a booth and sit down. She puts the device in the center of the table between them and switches it on. Up comes a hologram of space chess. Like the one that we saw in A New Hope. This is a little custom that Anakin and Padme have. They've been playing this same game of space chess for quite a while now. Anakin makes his move. They subtly smile at each other across the table. Back at Maul's base, he is working away on some consoles when Moth Tarkin enters the room. Maul doesn't turn to face him. What is it, Tarkin? My workers at a Gentane mine came across something I thought you'd be interested in, which is Mandalorian iron. Maul turns. You're certain? Well, the machines can't cut through it. They ended up having to cut around it just to get it out of the rock. I presume that you would wish to inspect it yourself to make sure. Is it your workers or clones at the mine? My workers. Tell them to leave immediately. No one is to enter that mine again until I arrive. Very good. I have a squadron of soldiers nearby that can provide security for you. When would you like to leave? Maul walks past him and out the door. Right now. Tarkin grins to himself. Yes, my lord. Mandalorian iron is a very special and rare form of iron in the Star Wars universe. Reason being, it can be forged to form armor, which can actually block a lightsaber blade, laser blasts, and can even absorb 
Force Lightning, which we all know is something Palpatine is a really big fan of using. The next day, the ship carrying Anakin and Obi-Wan is leaving Coruscant. Anakin and Obi-Wan are sitting beside each other on consoles. Anakin is looking over some of the recorded chess moves between him and Padme. Obi-Wan glances over at his screen. Is that a different game between you two? No, no, it's still the same one. That has to be the longest game in history. I don't understand it. I can plan actual battles and win, but when it comes to playing her, I just can't beat her. She is very good. I hear she was one of the best back on Alderaan. No one was willing to play her anymore. She wipes them out in a matter of minutes. Well, I've survived this long, so I must be doing something right. You're pretty good. Maybe you could give me some pointers. Obi-Wan leans over and has a look at the screen. I thought I had her cornered a few times, but she always manages to get away. You thought you had her cornered. That's just it. It's all a game of deception. Obi-Wan goes quiet for a while as he ponders over the moves on the screen. The Chancellor didn't tell me that Master Windu was coming on the mission as well. He made it sound like it was going to be just the two of us. It was supposed to be, but the Council decided to send him with us. I guess it makes sense. Maul will have his sister with him, so if there's two of them, it's better that there's three of us. It would be better if there was four or five of us, but this is a war that has many fronts, and we don't even know if Maul will be there. He will be there. I know it. A trooper approaches them. We've gone into hyperspace. Master Window will be briefing the men in five minutes. We'll be there. The trooper leaves and Obi-Wan gets up to walk out. Shall we? Wait a second, the game. Oh, right, the game. Well, you don't need to worry about losing. 